you know, they're basically baby photos of the early solar system. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast, brought to you from the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. I'm John Planny Fisher and I'm joined with the usual snor- smorgasbord of regular hosts, Ricky <laughs> here. Hi. <laughs> Priscilla. Hello. Tom Harvey is just below me. Hello. And this week, all the way from Milton Keynes at the Open University, it's Ross Finley. How's it going? Hello there. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, the suffering in the cold a bit and uh, in <laughs> yep, the uh, yep. nice confines of my, my living room, for sentence today. Yep. Indeed, yeah. I was just Good. saying off camera, I'm also quite cold. Um. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yes, you're at the Open University. You're doing a PhD at the moment, is that right? And think, I, uh, what year are you in, actually? I'm not quite sure. I'm at, so I like to call myself a 2.4 year at the moment it's what i'm telling everybody <laughs> so i'm in my third year now but um it's uh due to the whole global thing it's been you know six ish months i'd say kind of a bit delayed but yeah. um yeah I'm, I'm in my third year at the moment but kind of doing what i would have done in march yeah. so um yeah. yeah that's where i am at the moment and of course you do a lot of stuff on chondrites as i, I, I do yeah, yeah so um basically uh, if you remember a, f- a few months ago, there was a talk by Dr. Ashley King on about uh, water-rich meteorites and stuff mm. from outer solar system. And my work is very related to that, except I use um, that's a very special set of isotopes of the element oxygen to essentially unravel some of the secrets. In fact, the, uh, the uh, title of my original project that I applied for, the reason it was so enticing was the fact that it was called Unraveling the Secrets of the Early Solar System. I don't know whether I'm quite doing that, but um, I'm certainly kind of unpicking a few stitches. <laughs> at least. So. Well, I guess, yeah, oxygen isotopes, I guess it's not really something we've talked about very much um, on this podcast before, but I, as I understand, and perhaps correct me if I'm wrong then, Ross, um, they're quite special in the sense that they change depending on where you are in the solar system. So every every sort of body in the solar system has a diff, slightly different oxygen isotope signature. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, kind of in the in the latter twentieth century and and the early two uh, thousands, they were really all the rage um, in I, kind of understanding solar system bodies and processes um, and. Uh, in the lead up to these these missions that are coming back from asteroids, they're starting to regain a bit of a, a bit of traction. But yeah, and oxygen isotopes essentially are really uh, really special because uh, first and foremost, oxygen is the third most I believe it's the third third most abundant element in the universe after hydrogen and helium. Um, I thought it was carbon initially, but I think it's, I think it's oxygen, and um, that that means that it's really ubiquitously spread out uh, everywhere. And the second thing that's really useful about them is that they're present in all sorts of different phases. Instead of just being a, you know, like a gas or a, or a, or a solid, it's actually present in solid, liquid and gas forms. So you get uh, oxygen bound in water and liquid water and water ice, but you also get oxygen bound in, in gases like CO, carbon monoxide and water vapor. But you also get it in rocks. So something that I just completely went over my head as a, I'm a, I'm a geology uh, undergraduate initially, um, was that rocks are actually got lots of oxygen in them. Silicate is uh, SiO2, so you get all three. Yeah. And then, yeah, the, the third most uh, important thing is that each, there are three isotopes. There's 16O, 17O and 18O, which means you can plot something called a three isotope plot, which is where all the magic happens, essentially. So yeah, you can, you can use it to to unravel all sorts of things and each solar system body will plot in a different area on this graph yeah i mean it's absolutely fascinating really and so i guess um so i guess we've used that on various sort of meteorites and chondrite classes i guess and we were able to to group them up slightly then i suppose yeah so you get long yes it, it, i thought so as part of my master's degree um when i was studying for my master's at, at, at durham um, I w- was looking into some uh, several different other isotopic systems and they, they were somewhat complicated, but they all kind of had their purpose, you know, whereas oxygen kind of has all these different applications you can, you can do to it. And, and, and um, the, the most well-known one is, yeah, being able to kind of identify a, a planet or an asteroid or something due to its 
oxygen isotope composition. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's quite a cool topic and I can kind of explain some of the fractionation stuff if you'd like. Is that, that the sort of thing that you'd like to hear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my next yeah, so question yeah. Yeah. is going to be, yeah. why do you get different ratios of these different mm -hmm. isotopes? Yeah, so first and foremost, um, you kind of, it, it goes back towards, you start off in like a solar, solar system beginning situation where you have a solar nebula. And um, you, you have, you'll probably have different uh, processes at this point that um, take, they take the oxygen isotopes of different masses and can concentrate certain masses in certain areas depending on certain processes. And uh, they form little reservoirs in this, in the, if you imagine a solar system is forming and it's got like a planetary, protoplanetary disk, you'll, you'll have different locations in that disk that might have different oxygen isotopic compositions. Um, but when you start getting planets forming, um, those big planets start to heat up and they start to, they start to melt. And that kind of homogenizes all of their isotopes from that specific area that they formed in the disk into a single uh, line on a oxygen isotope plot. And it's quite cool the way this actually works because um, isotopes, uh, the, the best analogy, so if I go off on a tangent, you tell me, but the best <laughs> analogy is a, a mass spectrometer in, in, in the lab um, can separate out small little atoms according to their mass. So a, a, an oxygen 60, atom um, can be separated from the 17 and the 18 using the concept of ionization so you take the oxygen atom and you and you ionize it and then you send it flying along a, 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 a tube and it's bent by a, a big magnet and it's collected um, and that is actually kind of man-induced fractionation like we we are actually taking those those uh, those oxygen isotope different oxygen isotopes and, and, and separating them out according to their mass um, and nature actually does this as well. So it's something um, that nature, nature does because nature actually sometimes prefers different isotopes over the other. And this actually has nothing to do with their chemistry or their reactivity. It's just um, the fact that it weighs a little bit less. And when you have large planets melting, the oxygen isotopes kind of all equilibrate with each other. Yeah. And so because we we measure them in certain ways that kind of that means we can identify their fingerprint as a planetary body and i don't want to get too big into the specifics there because it'll, it'll, it'll kind of confuse i'm probably confusing myself but i don't want to confuse uh to you know, go into too many different protocols but um it's, it's how we measure them we measure them as ratios as opposed to just absolute values but also once we once we get uh get the composition of the the these asteroids or meteorites we can actually uh, pair them to the reservoirs in which they formed hypothetically because we haven't actually been to many of them yet <laughs> so we mentioned before that you're looking at chondrites mm -hmm. um, why are you using oxygen isotopes to look at chondrites so a lot of people you've had on the podcast talk a lot about water in the early solar system and water in minerals and stuff and so I'm afraid I'm kicking the dead horse and I'm looking at water as well but it's from a very different perspective um, I don't look at water in little minerals in terms of uh, looking at it or zapping it with ions or anything like that um, I do it on a little bit of a bigger scale so um, in the early solar system and the outer solar system you had these bodies that got very water rich they formed where water could uh, could kind of condense and freeze and um water is a very a kind of tantalizing topic because you know it's essential for life and it's essential for driving our plate tectonics but our planets have quite a lot of water on them for what we would expect if the solar system forms the way we thought it did which was um, liquid water couldn't exist where earth formed or where mars formed and mars has got some pretty hefty evidence for water and um so i'm looking at the the uh the outer solar system bodies these these uh carbon rich carbonaceous water rich asteroids that may have actually at some point delivered water to earth so this is the 
hypothesis you see that everyone loves it. it's like oh water water was delivered by asteroids and and maybe maybe it delivered the ingredients for life but we've got this big glaring problem it's a problem that is only really starting to come to light so um, if i give you a, a scenario you have a you have a meteorite that has water and organics in it and people start analyzing it and getting really excited but they haven't looked at it properly so when you don't look at it properly, you bypass all of its interesting internal complexity. So it's kind of like you always need a geologist to look at these rocks in as much detail as you possibly can to kind of then relate it to these big hypotheses. And so that's kind of what my PhD is. Um, I'm, I'm looking at how water, uh, the, how water evolved in the solar system and what the... Um, these bodies that may have delivered water to Earth actually looked like from an oxygen perspective. And that might sound a bit kind of convolute, but uh, many previous measurements have kind of taken these meteorites and pulverized them into a great big kind of vial of powder. And then you get a lot of researchers going, what, why the hell are all my different aliquots of meteorite plotting all over the place? And it's because we haven't looked at the weird complexity inside these meteorites yet. So that's my job. Okay, so basically you're doing in situ measurements then of, uh, of these things or? Ah, it's, quite, it's, a, it's like a, um, a, a duo. It's like a, a, a marvelous dance between two different techniques. So. Uh, yeah, have you heard of the na nanosims and stuff like mm -hmm. that? So yeah, yeah um, uh, the nanosims, which is which is a technique that kind of looks in detail by analyzing analyzing very small areas. That's yeah, amazing spatial resolution. It's so it's very very good, but the pro the big problem um, with a nanosims kind of perspective is that the uh, precision is 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 good, but it's kind of in the realm of I don't. 0 0.1 to 2 per mil sometimes, which is quite a large variation, mm. um, a large uncertainty. Um, and so uh, I use a technique that has much higher precision, but it sacrifices all spatial resolution. Right. And so I've got this problem, this, this problem that we start with, which is how do we get that spatial resolution back? Yeah. And so in order to do that, I have to look at it in detail and use like, a little dentist's drill. It's literally a dentist's drill. I have to go on a, uh, go on a dentist website. I became very uh, um, familiar with all the terminology of dentistry <laughs> and, and horrible, my teeth would hurt so much after looking at them all. So you get these horrible burrs full of diamonds and everything. And, and you use these little drills to actually drill out kind of anywhere between 50 and three to 500 micron wide holes to get the powder to run a bulk analysis. So you, you're kind of doing a, uh, a, a two, two scale approach where you, you yeah. establish the context before, before running it, as opposed to just powdering it all together and then yeah. running it. Well, that's really cool though. So it's tiny, tiny volumes of, of mass then. Uh, but again, yeah. I suppose because it's mostly oxygen, I guess you can get away with some, some, some yeah, much small so volumes. Because it's, it's not trace. So yeah, oxygen's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty abundant so when on all those phases you've got oxygen bound in in the rocks themselves and in the minerals but uh, it still is a small amount so um uh at the, at the ou we've got this very special machine which is used to measure oxygen isotopes uh in it particularly in an uh, extraterrestrial context a lot of meteorites and it's a technique called laser fluorination. Right, I've um, heard of this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's a really really cool concept, and it sounds very kind of deadly and James Bond like. Um, so, yeah, uh, remind me about the small sample mass because I'll get to that. But I'll explain a little bit about laser fluorination if you if you like. Absolutely, as I understand it, it it's it's the best way to do oxygen isotopes. It's not at least it gives you the, the smallest sort of error bars. Yeah. So so as I said before, the uh, the SIMS uh, secondary ion mass spectrometry or nano SIMS gives you kind of yeah in the point one to it's kind of in the, the first decimal place in terms of precision. Um, and the, on, the only other technique apart from laser fluorination is something called UV uh, ablation. It's laser ablation instead of fluorination. And that's got enormous 
errors on it as well, uh, which is good if your samples um, have huge variations in their composition, you can probably identify it, but laser fluorination has 0.02 per mil precision um, on uh, capital Delta 17O, which is this special value that we look at. Um, and it can, and, but you, the sacrifices, you need quite a bit of powder to do that, that um, on the broad side of things. But anyway, yeah, um, it is the most precise way, I think, that we have of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of analyzing things. So you have your powder and you essentially, you, you put it inside a little well in, in, that's made of nickel and you seal it within the safest possible clamping system that you can and you pump one of the most horrible chemicals known to man in it which is called uh, bromine pentafluoride brf5 and this is one of the only things that's more oxidizing than oxygen itself so it's more oxidizing than its namesake and uh if, if you chuck this in with your sample the sample um won't do anything just ambiently so you have to fire this uh, big co2 yeah 50 watt laser at it uh don't quote me on that i don't know if it's 50 watts you don't go you don't go all the way up to 50 watts <laughs> but you put this very powerful weight laser and you melt the sample and react it in the presence of this thing this uh this reagent brf5 which swaps the oxygen out of the sample and sends it out into the chamber and instead of having your sample there anymore you have like a, a load of salts and fluorides mm -hmm. left and then you've got pure oxygen gas along with a lot of other crud so we have to take that oxygen gas and we clean it up through a series of cool looking nitrogen traps and then at the end you have pure oxygen gas going into the mass spectrometer so that's how we end up getting the uh, getting the oxygen isotope measurements so it's pretty cool mm -hmm. And um, the reason uh, this, the sample mass is, is kind of required, um, so you want to get a good, a good analysis. You want enough micro, uh, sorry, you want enough millivolts of oxygen into the mass spectrometer to be able to get good statistics. Mm -hmm. And um, in order to get a decent amount, you have to have between one and two milligrams of material for a general run which doesn't sound like an awful lot, but it's, you can see it. You, that, that it's like a little pile of powder. And so when you're talking about things like interplanetary dust particles and micrometeorites, it becomes a lot more problematic to... Yeah. That, and that's just because there's, there's so little 16 uh, and 17 in, in, in these samples. Oh, not 16, uh, 18, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's totally true. So, so um, yeah, 18 is kind of... Yeah, almost like a minor element, and then seventeen is like a trace. It's like almost not non-existent, like compared to sixteen. Um, so you need a lot to be able to to be able to get get both measurements. Um, and uh, so that's standard standard running. So if you wanted to analyze something, so from the perspective of like geology undergrads, if you wanted to analyze a piece of obsidian, um, you'd have to load about one or two milligrams into this machine. You, you laser it in the presence of this horrible compound and you get the gas and it's great. You have a wonderful high precision measurement. Now, um, there's a bit of a problem with some samples in that the ones I'm looking at that have been interacted with water are full of minerals called phyllosilicates. Mm -hmm. And phyllosilicates have uh, OH bound in their, their structure. And some of them are more kind of, some of them have actual water in between the layers and some of them have it kind of bound as OH, some of them don't. But they have a tendency to, to react with this horrible reagent at room temperature. So if you, um, if you imagine a sample tray with like multiple trays, as soon as multiple holes, as soon as you expose all of these holes to this reagent and start lasering one of them, all the other ones start reacting as well. And you get this horrible measurement where it doesn't really work anymore. So um, from, the, from the perspective of running like, yeah, an obsidian or a glass, you, you can run like 20 of those in one tray. Whereas the ones that I'm doing, I have to analyze one at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, because it's, I'm involving this micro drilling as well, we have to take it a step further and use a really special um, mass spec thing called a micro volume, which enables you to run really small amounts of gas, which enables us to bring that sample mass from like a milligram or two down to something as little as 120 micrograms. So 
it's a bit of a kind of like a hornet's nest of problems that we're trying to deal with but it's a it's a establishing protocol which yeah, is great it's cool you can do that i mean it's oh, like an awful ever... lot of delicate work yeah yeah it is a bit delicate <laughs> <laughs> when you're doing this do you have to worry about um, moisture in the air um, affecting the yeah, results yeah. at all so there's loads of different ways we can go about trying to stop uh, interaction with moisture so the first thing we do is we before we put it into the sample when we put it into the sample chamber we bake the sample um mm -hmm. overnight so yeah moisture from the air is a huge problem and um when you run anhydrous samples normal samples you uh, you do something called the blank procedure where you pump in some of this reagent without lasering it and it reacts with all the atmospheric moisture that's on the surface of these samples mm -hmm. And then, um, and then you pump it away, and then you can then you can react the sample, and you get like a small, small tiny contribution from whatever's left over. But it's usually insignificant, like one microgram of oxygen compared to the one thousand five hundred you get from the sample. So it's very very small. Whereas my samples, where they pre-react, you can't really blank out the procedure that long. So we do, we do like a a shorter version and then actually measure the isotopic composition of that blank so we can make a correction if we want to. So it's quite, it's quite in depth. <laughs> you know, when you're drilling your samples, so you've got your contract and you're drilling out the area you want to get the powder from, mm -hmm. what specifically are you looking for on the, on the sample to drill oh, out? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I study the, my entire project is based on these samples that we think may have come from, the outer solar system they're called cm chondrites mm. they're all the rage because they uh it's what's coming back hopefully or what has just come back from 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 Ryugu and high boost too um so i mentioned before that you know previous research has bypassed a lot of this internal complexity that you get within these meteorites and that's because um they're they've probably come from a a body that's been turbulated and smashed apart over four and a half billion years so you get all these weird looking rock types in cms you get some that look kind of metal rich you get some that are completely altered to to kind of mud uh, you get some that are in between and there's a whole spectrum of alteration and when you get a sample say i don't know a, a, a CM arrives in Milton Keynes and we have the Milton Keynes meteorite. Uh, if you get a lump of that, uh, you're going to have a random distribution of all these rock types, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whereas person B is going to have a random distribution in his sample. And so what normally happens is people get really excited and start smashing it up into mm -hmm. aliquots and getting analyzed for organics and getting analyzed for, for spectroscopy and stuff like that. And it's like taking a conglomerate from the Himalayas mm. and, and smashing it up and saying, okay, I want to understand the whole Himalayas from this. And while you'll get an awful lot, you won't get a lot of the context because you might have like bits and pieces from all over the place. Yeah. So I'm looking at actually these classes of different rock types inside the CMs, which span this alteration sequence. Mm -hmm. And that in theory, uh, when you have this, these breccias, these broken rocks, um, it, there is a high probability that a lot of the rock types you're seeing are from the same asteroid. So when you see all these, these different rock types, some people say, oh, they're all impact derived. They might, some of them might be, but a lot of them probably come from the actual parent body itself, which says a lot about the parent body. And so when you get literature that says, okay, meteorite one says the parent body looks like this. And then meteorite two says the parent body looks like this. Well, maybe it's both. And the parent body, the source asteroid or bodies had very complex internal structures mm -hmm. that have been subsequently blasted apart and recombined into this broken rock. So that's what I'm milling out. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess it's interesting, isn't it? I guess there's a lot of, I guess, something we've not really touched upon too much then um, over, over the years really is that there's, there's a lot of debate in terms of how chondrites form in the first place I suppose so I guess this helps to try to address some of these questions then about how the um the chondrites actually formed or in terms of the well in, in terms the, of what goes on on the parent body and in terms of yeah yeah uh, that, that's exactly it's exactly it and so <laughs> asteroids are really complex things and 
you know, they're basically baby photos of the early solar system. Um, and so it, it, things were going on then four and a half billion years ago that we can actually see, which mm. is crazy when you think about it. And uh, understanding them, you have to understand the samples to be able to understand the, the asteroids. Mm. And uh, yeah, I don't know whether that answers your question, but this it is why the sa- anyway. <laughs> when the uh, when when these sample return things come back, this is what's really interesting, is because the stuff that we're getting off these asteroids is, is the first time we're getting stuff from asteroids in any meaningful amount. You know, we had one mission before that got a few thousand particles, but um, the uh, the actual getting of sample from an asteroid is really cool because. Our meteorites, they have lots of cool looking rock types in it, but they're actually, in terms of meteorite terms, they're quite badass. They've survived this entry mm. into the uh, into the atmosphere, whereas the stuff that is on the top of an asteroid is probably fluffy, like the stuff you find in your hoover. <laughs> and you can't, and, and it's never going to survive getting through to Earth. So we can complete the picture, which is quite cool. Yeah, I guess that's an important point, isn't it? I suppose that meteorite record is inherently biased then, isn't it, I suppose? And particularly when you want to worry about water and another quite volatile phases. Um, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it is. And all the stuff that's on the surface of asteroids is is going to be like contaminated by things like space weathering as well. So it's why Hayabusa is interesting, having dug, a, dug itself into the asteroid a bit. Um, it, it'll be really interesting to see what we get back and hopefully understand a bit more about water in the solar system, mm-hmm. which is uh, which will kind of end the decades a decades old debate about where it might or may not have come from. How how many different um, samples from separate meteorites have you been able to analyze? Uh, so I I've analyzed in total. So as part of my PhD, I have three falls, which are meteorites that have been observed to fall. It's like I was destined to do it because as I, I had one meteorite per year of me doing my PhD has fallen to earth of the ones that I'm looking at. So I'm really look, really lucky. Um, and I'm also looking at uh, a whopping great big one from Antarctica. Um, it's, uh, it's a really interesting, huge lump. So this, you know, these things can be quite expensive. But the, uh, the the gentleman who who donated it to the OU, or well, then it gave it to Richard Greenwood, one of my supervisors. Uh, his name's Mike Zelensky in uh, in all the way over in America. And uh, this this big lump from Antarctica is is one of the most brecciated meteorites that we have. It's got in this lump that is probably two hundred grams. It's quite big. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of, a, of, a, of an analog. It's probably I've got a hair tie. It's probably about <laughs> probably about this big. You've got several hundred clasps in it, which could probably be analysed. Um, so I'm looking in detail at this one, and I'm also looking at uh, these three falls, of which one fell in 2017, one fell in 2018, and one 2019, and one fell this year in 2020. Um, and uh, we don't know whether or not they all come from the same asteroid or whether they all come from different asteroids. It's probably like a combination of both. Um, and so this is, this is what the project is kind of hoping to unravel a little bit, whether or not they come from the same body, whether or not these types of bodies were really widespread and whether or not ultimately it reflects what the composition of the water was like in, in that part of the disk in essence. And are you specifically looking at falls because it prevents a lot of contamination to the sample? Well, initially, my project was really only supposed to be concerned with this Antarctic meteorite, but the falls represent a really good opportunity because, like you say, most of them have been recovered prior to rainfall. They haven't been rained on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at the falls because you get an unweathered perspective, and it's also super fresh, and it's... it's nice and publishable <laughs> when, it, when it comes around to it um and uh yeah they're really really interesting and really cool and so one of them is it, it was called uh aguazarcus i don't know if you've heard of it uh lately it was the biggest cm fall since a meteorite called murchison all the way several decades ago which yeah. was just kilograms of stuff mm. and it's more than you could ask for really because you're never going to bring it back a a 20 kilo lump of an asteroid so it's, it's mother nature's sample return it just 
it doesn't give you the context that's the annoying part it's like it's a bit like a like a game of Sherlock Holmes like who, what have they brought back for me you know <laughs> Um, so do you know what's happening with the Hayabusa samples then? Um, um, do you get no. a look at them or anyone in your group? So mm, I'm probably never going to see anything of, probably not Hayabusa 2 and, and, and maybe not Osiris Rex, I don't know. I'm, I'm not directly involved at all. My supervisor um, and several people in my department uh, are involved in Osiris Rex, but I, as far as I know, the only person I know who's involved in Hayabusa is Luke. Luke Daly from Glasgow. Um, so I, I'll be very interested to see all, all the results. And I think my work will prepare me well for understanding it. Um, whether, whether or not I'll ever see it, I don't know. It's all a bit precious at the moment, I think. Um, the, the laser fluorination line at the OU is kind of optimal for, we are really developing protocol for running awkward samples in small volumes. So um, there will become a day, maybe while I'm long gone, where Osiris Rex material may be analysed there, which will be really cool. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we should let our listeners know Ross is actually 95 years old. That's why he says long gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, 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 no, 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 yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, long gone in terms of, uh, in terms of moved on from the PhD. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Fingers crossed if I get to the end. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that got morbid. <laughs> you did a bit, you did a bit. No, 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 I'm enjoying myself. It's fine. <laughs> Mm. So it's, it sounds though like a lot of preparation work then to get from you know originally having your your, your meteorite you want to look at and and ending up at the point where you're, you're doing your oxygen isotopes. I guess you've got a lot of characterization and stuff to do in the in between. Yeah, so it's, it it gets a, it's a labor of love really. You, you you don't know when is ever is the right time to start drilling into a meteorite that you've spent months and months staring at a microscope, yeah. and there has to be a point where it's it's starting. Um, so I've spent the past, the best part of my first year and most of my second year before the lockdown characterizing these samples. And I've approached the end now where I've kind of, I've got the samples I want. All of them have been, they're at some phase in their characterization and I'm beginning to micromill. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a big decision to choose where you want to go. In fact, I haven't actually milled any meteorites yet. I'm doing, I'm practicing on, on terrestrial analogs. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at okay. things like, uh, like serpentinized, um, uh, basalts and everything okay. like that. So it's, it's, it's I love to... how those planetary scientists treat terrestrial rocks. Yeah. It is just like, yeah. yeah, I'll just chuck some of those in. <laughs> Trash. It is not worth anything. It's fine. Well, I, I was thinking about this actually, and what amazes me more, more than anything is that there's only one Earth and C type asteroids. Yeah, we haven't really got much of it, but there's more, more C type asteroid material out there than probably like 10 Earths or something in all the solar systems that we can observe. And uh, we're so interested and so set on getting it. And it's like, okay, yeah, it's going to unravel these secrets. But one day we'll probably be mining them and people will be looking on our own planet and thinking, oh, we were, we're, we're standing on the interesting stuff the whole time. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of how I feel a bit about it. I, I, I get very tempted to go back into terrestrial geology as well. But, um, <laughs> but at the moment, I'm kind of, yeah, drawn to the extraterrestrial stuff because we don't know much about it. Mm. But yeah, it's uh, interesting. <laughs> Um, how has lockdown affected all of your lab work then? Oh yeah, so it pretty much halted it as I was starting my data collection. Mm -hmm. So I would, that started in March, and the OU um, had a has had a very good approach to everything in that it's been very cautious in how how it sends people back to work. And I was lucky in that I was one of the first few to actually go back um, back in uh, the end of July, beginning of August. And I've, that kind of, while it was good, it didn't quite coincide with all the labs getting to the point where multiple people could work in them and stuff like that. So it's been a long few months getting to that stage, but I'm finally at the stage I was in March again. So I'm, that's good. I'm, yeah, last month has been really intense because it's kind of, you know, you're, we've missed, we've kind of missed summer. And I don't really, I don't really remember some summer happening, and suddenly I'm back in the intense work that I was before, and there's no daylight, and it's all a bit kind of whoa. <laughs> let's, let's get it all done while we can, you know. Um, but yeah, it's um, it, it hopefully hasn't impacted it too much, and I know that I can get something out of it, which is which is the main thing. 
Yeah. Are you able to extend your project? Uh, with any luck, yes. So I'm I'm part of the kind of third year cohort, mm -hmm. which I think um, UKRI may give some extra funding mm -hmm. to. Uh, I haven't had any confirmation or I haven't applied for anything yet. Um, so I've still got a year of funding and in terms of baseline funding and a year after that to, to write and submit if I want to. Um, so in the worst case scenario, if there's no funding or extensions, then you know, I'll get as far as I can and then we'll, uh, I'll get writing. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, we hope you can get that. Um, uh, talking to the future then. So obviously you haven't run your actual samples yet, but once you've run your samples, what, what are you looking for? What are you expecting to see? Okay. So I'll backtrack a little bit to, to the isotope theory. Mm -hmm. So like I said, nature kind of, separates isotopes out uh, this is this is something that's called mass fractionation mass dependent fractionation yeah uh, but there's also another type of fractionation which doesn't rely on mass alone it relies on a concept called mixing and so when you get like a big planet in a mass fractionation sense and it homogenizes it's it's kind of how nature sorts the sorts the prep for having certain isotopes over the other into its rocks. Whereas if you've got, uh, say, water interacting with minerals and stuff like that, it's probably happening at low temperature and you've probably got small scale kind of processes and stuff. Mm. So I'm actually looking at the interaction of different types of reservoirs um, in the solar system from the perspective of water. And uh, once I've got my measurements, um, I will I will have a better idea of how that happened, and I can compare it to the big wigs who came before, who made all these models about asteroids. So um, there's a there's a gentleman uh, there was a gentleman called Robert Clayton, and his uh, his uh, science partner uh, uh, the second name is Matt Mader, but I can't remember the first name. Bless her, sorry. Um, and they pioneered oxygen isotopes uh, by doing a slightly different method to what we did. And they developed this, uh, this model about how they think an asteroid was made and how they think it would have looked, whether it had been stratified, a bit like an onion, like, you know, hot in the middle with all the water interacting with the minerals. And it's kind of slightly metamorphosing this kind of 50 kilometer sized proto planet baby thing. And then as you get progressive out towards the outer shell and the regolith it gets more and more unaltered and more pristine and this is what gets like disturbed and blasted apart and reformed to make a cm and so once i've milled it all out i will get a better idea for how effective that model is and how effective the competitors were because there's a few a few notable authors came up with alternative theories and this is in, in, a, in a nutshell is whether or not the alteration occurred closed in a closed system or whether it was open and whether the asteroids were like giant mud balls turbulating in the early solar system or whether it was more like a bucket of wet sand. And so it's, it, it has all sorts of different approaches and, and the conclusions you can get from it are wide and varied. <laughs> Amazing. I feel we need to get you some props, Ross. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm very, everyone always, uh, everyone always says I'm very animated. <laughs> no, it's, great. It's, it's, it's even worse when I'm giving a presentation. Like, give me a stick. I'm like, Mr. Bean. You know, <laughs> things away. Sorry, my hands get carried away. <laughs> um, so it would be great to ask you, how did you end up looking at space rocks? It's, it, probably the lamest answer you're ever going to hear, but it has huge implications for how I got here. So when I was about six, my father bought a 1998 desktop computer with a game on it called Homeworld. I don't know if any of you have ever played a game called Homeworld, and it sounds really, really lame, but it was one of the first real-time strategy 3D space games that was ever made. And... I remember watching him playing this and I got completely like mesmerized by it. Like the, and it's really weird. You mesmerized by like a representation of space inside a computer in 1999 or something like it, <laughs> it looked like potatoes floating around, but 
it was where I learned what an asteroid was and what a nebula was and everything. And, and while I wasn't obsessed with this game for my whole life or everything, it kind of planted the seeds of interest. And I don't know if I'd be where I was if I hadn't played this game. So uh, it has a big impact on on the, on how I got here. And, and I, I quickly realized I wanted to study something and I was decided when I was about 15 that I was going to be an astrophysicist. And then I like screwed up A-level maths. So that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I decided that maybe a more kind of a practical approach would be, would be easier. And I'd always loved crystals and stuff. So I, I went for geology for A-level and I then went on to do it as, as, as an undergraduate degree at Durham. And then I got into contact with someone in Durham who did a little bit of work on, on chondrites, uh, looking at platinum group elements completely different story and uh, I did my I did my postgraduate kind of uh, experience then and then yeah I, I, I picked up a, a, a notification on the UKPF stuff so and uh, actually ended up coming to the OU so it's kind of like a, a slow progression through through time <laughs> it's, it's funny those initial things that sort of spark that seed isn't it yeah, but some gone... people say yeah <laughs> some so people say they, gone... they've been looking at things in uh, in books and stuff you know and uh, yeah it's a game <laughs> have you gone back to that game recently to see if it still holds up to um, well <laughs> yeah the developers actually remastered it in 2015 so it's oh. in all modern graphics so I'd, uh, yeah. I, I'd highly recommend it it's, mm. it's like a really uh, amazing space opera adventure with lots of action and yeah it's really cool Mm. Yeah, props to Homeworld. <laughs> I should say, other it's space true. games are available. <laughs> <laughs> the game also has a strangely accurate representation of the internal structure of a CM. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, yeah, the, the, the re resource collectors are, like ripping it apart or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you the game I want to see, Isotope Simulator. How cool that be? <laughs> oh, well, actually, if, you, if you're interested, Interested in a weird kind of game like that? Uh, try Space Chem. It's like a uh, it's it's, an, it's like a simulator where you can you can make you can chemically engineer your own molecules in like a it's kind of like a story setting and it's a bit like that. It's kind of like a simulator. So Sounds I'd quite cool. Actually, I might check that out. <laughs> <laughs> right? Should we should we ask the the ultimate question? Yes, the final yeah. question. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'll take the lead then, Ross. I'm afraid we have an ultimate question for you. Um, that is something we ask everyone who comes on the podcast, so don't feel special. You're not the first we've asked. Um, <laughs> if you weren't um, looking at CM Chondrites, what do you think you'd want to be doing with your life? Oh, <clears throat> uh, I've kind of got two answers. I think if I was still academic, I've, I've always wanted to be more of a pure chemist in some regards. I'd love to go down analytical chemistry but if we're going from like a you know complete rewrite rewrite reboot of my life so i had to make a decision when i was 18 um to go to university or to uh maybe go down a more practical role and i was i was very tempted to follow my dad's footsteps because he's a blacksmith so um oh, wow. I, I was grew up around blacksmithing and did a lot of it when i was when i was younger and by the time i was 18 or 19 i was kind of in the in the the rocket seat to take on a the blacksmithing apprenticeship so so to speak but i ended up doing a degree <laughs> so that's that that's where it happened and uh yeah i was surrounded by lots of crafty people people who do a lot of nature conservation and woodwork so i'd probably be some sort of like wild man of the woods or something but, um, <laughs> uh, but uh that, yeah it, thankfully i went on to go and do some uh, science so here i am <laughs> just looking like a wild man of the woods <laughs> so i don't mean to sound ignorant but what do blacksmiths blacksmith nowadays so yeah it's it's uh, at one point i think I think, uh, I mean, you know, my dad will be able to probably say, uh, saying I'm doing everything wrong, but uh, uh, back... Uh, he's back, on next week, so we'll... Yeah, we'll, yeah, there we go. Back in the, um, yeah, back in kind of like uh, the late 20th century, blacksmithing was on a bit of a decline, but it kind of had a bit of a resurgence lately um, in artist blacksmithing. So obviously, mm. originally, people were making swords and armor and horseshoes and stuff like that, and spades and plows for their estates. But since the Industrial Revolution and manufacturing, there's no, no need for that. Although I would argue that hand-forged stuff holds up a lot more than mass-produced stuff. But um, yeah, so it, it lies mostly in making very 
ornate stuff for people with quite a lot of money. So it's um, people who can afford to deck their houses in in lovely like balustrades and chandeliers and and garden ornaments. Um, there can there can be there can be enough there to make a living. Yeah, you know, it no must be much more satisfying as well producing like more sort of ornate stuff and more artistry involved rather than just producing a bunch of shovels yeah yeah yes it is and it, it's kind of evolving into its own thing entirely like a lot of a lot of blacksmiths kind of combine modern technology like welding and and laser cutting and everything like that to with the traditional craft to make these really wacky sculptures mm-hmm. and um yeah and you do get you do get a lot of people and uh, for our, our cousins over the pond i don't want to sound bad here but you get a lot of people especially in america who are very obsessed with with making swords and things like, and, and, and stuff like that so you get a lot of a lot of people making replicas and uh, you know making frost more from world of warcraft and yeah. like it's all really really <laughs> be, uh really uh dominant in that regard <laughs> it'll be well decked out to go to these renaissance fairs i suppose doesn't it? yeah 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 that's, that's exactly <laughs> it yeah oh that's awesome and yeah so i haven't been in the forge for a while but i might go back if i'm lucky if <laughs> you know christmas <laughs> brilliant so yeah so ross thanks very much it uh, sounds like a fascinating project and i hope uh, the rest of uh, all your lab work goes well uh, but to all you in the audience if you want more earth and solar system content don't forget to check out all our social media links in the episode description and on the screen below us just now Uh, But in the meantime, we'll see you all very soon. Um, I'll take care. Goodbye.